I, uh, I kind of like Mystery of the Emblem more than Genealogy in Thracia. Shozo Kaga. Even uttering his name will evoke some kind of emotion. Admiration, love, appreciation, anger, rage. The father of the Fire Emblem series, the architect behind Fire Emblem 1 through Fire Emblem 5, and the creator of Terring, Berwick, and Vesteria Saga. In my time playing Fire Emblem, being around various Fire Emblem communities, whenever his name does come up, I found that the context usually has to do with Genealogy of the Holy War or Thracia 776. Gaiden as well, and by extension Echoes, but to a much lesser degree. And on the lower end of discussion in my experience has been Mystery of the Emblem and Fire Emblem 1. And I'm guilty of this too, and by no means do I want to act like I'm this proud hipster Fire Emblem player that discovered Fire Emblem 3, like I'm some kind of archaeologist for old Famicom games or something. But I mean, when was the last time you participated in a discussion about Mystery of the Emblem specifically? Unless you're chilling out in specific Kaga discords with the intent to talk about Fire Emblem 3, I feel like it kind of flies under the radar because of how obscure of a title it is and how hard to access um, New Mystery actually is since it never actually came out in the West and you have to play a translation for it. Anyway, yeah, once, twice, never? Hell, I've been playing Fire Emblem for literally at this point over half of my life and I, it's only been a month since I started playing it. Actually, is that even accurate? Maybe two weeks? It hasn't been very long. Over the last few weeks, I've been indulging myself in Kaga's work. I played Shadow Dragon and beat it, and had a pretty lukewarm impression of it. And then I decided to try Fire Emblem 12 out. Well, if you followed me on Twitter a couple weeks ago, you'd know that I found Fire Emblem 12 to be kind of disappointing for a first impression. Maybe it was just me getting tired of the DS's artwork, or the feel of the DS games, so I tried playing Fire Emblem 3. I didn't really know what to expect, to be honest. The closest reference I have was playing FE2, so I booted up Book 2. Well, if the title of this video is any indication, I loved Mystery of the Emblem. I beat it in three days. I enjoyed nearly every moment I played of it, and I could not stop playing it. It just had to be completed. It was like all I thought about. It really harkened me back to the times where I where I just couldn't stop playing the game, like when I was playing, when I was Let's Playing Gaiden, or when I was playing Three Houses in a hotel room, or at um, Otakuthon, it was one of those experiences where I just could not stop playing. And a big part of this video is actually trying to figure out why that was. What is it about this Super Famicom game from like the 90s that I just couldn't, that it was just something obsessed about? Too Long Didn't Watch, it's a fantastic game, which despite its admittedly archaic and clunky ways of doing some things, is refreshingly simple and intuitive, yet challenging and rewarding. So as a disclaimer, this review is going to be predominantly gameplay based. I don't have much to say on the story simply because I was playing an older translation which made the dialogue really really hard to follow along. I don't have many complaints and I haven't really heard anyone crap on Book 2's plot either. Aside from it being sort of a generic uh, JRPG collect the star orbs and shards tale, it was serviceable for me, but I do look forward to playing FE12's, FE12's version of the story or even playing an updated translation which I have heard that um, Project Naga, I want to say, is the team, or the, the team that did, um, the translations for the other, other Kaga games recently. I think they might be working on one, but don't take my word for it. If they are, then that's awesome, and I definitely, like, even try to stream it or something. I'm going to first talk about this game's mechanics, then the chapter gameplay, and work in class and unit mechanics and balance throughout. I've never actually done a review of this type before, so bear with me. Please. <laughs> Let's start with mechanics. There are a handful of gameplay mechanics that are mostly recognizable to a Fire Emblem player. If we were to pick up Fire Emblem 3 Book 2 immediately, there will be a few things you'll notice from the get-go. The Trade and the Inventory System The Trade and Inventory is the first version of modern trading in the series. While some may believe that Thracia 776 introduced modern trading, that accomplishment actually belongs to FE3. But this system is closer to Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn than it is to Thracia, Three Houses, and so on namely because each unit has two inventories, a weapon inventory and an item inventory, consisting of four slots each, which means any unit can carry up to four items and weapons. Mounting and dismounting, something you'd also recognize from FE4, FE5, and Three Houses first started in this game. 
In FE4, only Selif could dismount, but in FE5, all units could, and mounting and dismounting works essentially the same here. When dismounted, paladins and flyers can use only swords, and bow and mage knights could use only their prime weapon as well. Weapon level. Instead of weapon ranks ranging from E to S, weapon ranks in this game functioned like every other stat with plenty of weapon level stat boosters around the game. Each weapon has a weapon level requirement, and regardless of the weapon type, your weapon level would determine if the weapon could be held. For example, a silver sword had a weapon level of 9, but a silver lance had a weapon level of 7. So long as you had that level, you could use it. Astral Shards, Orbs, and Growth Modifiers Astral Shards and Orbs are held items which would add various growth modifiers to an ally. For example, the Libra Shard gave a unit minus 10% HP, plus 40% speed, plus 10% luck and weapon level, and minus 10 res. Taurus would give plus 5 growths across the board. They also stacked 2. This was revisited, but changed into strictly passive buffs in FE12, and returned to form in Echoes, but with nerfed growth rate modifiers. And also, Crusader Scrolls are largely influenced from this mechanic. Bond supports were also a thing in this game, which were kind of like the first iteration of how we've come to understand supports in Fire Emblem. In this game, if you were within three tiles of an ally who had a specific support, which you would definitely need to look up on a guide for, like on Serenades, you would get plus 10 hit avoiding crit, and these would also stack too. So that's basically the unique mechanics that were in FE3. So how did they play out in-game? Trading in inventory has admittedly aged not that well. Because of inventories being split, each inventory had to be handled individually. If I wanted to hand a Rider's Bane and a Vulnerary from Pala to Sheeta, I'd have to make two trades instead of one. But to put in perspective, it's merely just an extra step in an otherwise nuanced mechanic for its time. FE1 had a give item mechanic, which would cost an entire turn, and Gaiden only had a single item or weapon to trade because inventories were only one slot. This was indeed the origin of modern trading, and even coming from a game like Three Houses, it's honestly not that hard to get used to. Something else to Fire Emblem 3's credit about this system was the quality of life feature that went missing up until basically Fire Emblem 10 was the ability to sell and buy items directly from the supply. This was actually quite refreshing to see in its simple form, which was quite convenient to make a quick buck during a map, as these armories and vendors were on the map just like classic Fire Emblem. Like, not even FE5 had this, and neither did the GBA games for some reason even though they literally had merchants as characters in the later games. As for mounting and dismounting, it was an incredibly useful and strategic mechanic. In a game where flyers had incredible stat boosts being mounted and the best movement in the game, along with excellent weapon levels that allowed them to use silver weapons right off the bat, being restricted to being footlocked indoors, seeing the prevalence of bow users, as well as having generally weak defense and strength, made Flyers, while still the best class in the game, not invincible, discounting Pala because, oh my god, she is so good in this game, it is ridiculous. <laughs> I found myself needing to mount and dismount often, and it made several maps memorable for this mechanic. I also find that dismounting into being grounded and sword locked helps your already sword locked infantry stand out a little more. While paladins and flyers can dominate outdoors, infantry units like Ogma, Navarre, and even Marth can stand out even more in these more restrictive maps. Without dismounting, I fear that infantry would be hung up and be arguably objectively worse units similar to FE4. I understand that FE12 doesn't have mounting and dismounting, and they have reclassing, but if they didn't have that mechanic, I would question whether uh, getting rid of mounting and dismounting would have been a wise choice. Weapon level in FE3 is really intuitive visually. You know exactly what each weapon rank is, and because of how weapon level is treated, there's no time in between a B rank and an A rank. It's just numbers. Because it is based off of growth, it's not as reliable as how we come to understand the modern weapon rank system. But in practice, they're the highest growths in the game, and there are plenty of arm scrolls scattered throughout, and it won't be long until someone can use stronger weapons at all. So if you ask me, it's a mechanic that works for the game. The universality of the weapon level system really works with dismounting. A paladin will not be limited to using the lowest quality weapons if they are fighting indoors. This made the transition between mounting and dismounting feel more natural. Like I said, Bond supports weren't technically home to Fire Emblem 3 as Almond Selica had a guaranteed crit on Duma, but modern support bonuses originated in FE3. And with Fire Emblem 3's punishing 1RN, take advantage of these rates. 
One of my favorite mechanics in this game is certainly the Astral Shards. They are health items which modify character growths, and oh my god, can they ever turn an otherwise mediocre unit completely around. This is basically why I had so much fun training Warren, who has middling growths and has a abhorrent, inexplicable 10% speed growth, making him legitimately, objectively worse than Castor. However, these shards can stack as well, offering insane and at times guaranteed stat boosts for certain stats. Are they broken? Sort of? First of all, they're growth modifiers, which do not always guarantee stat procs. Secondly, these scrolls are spread throughout the game, so you can't immediately stack the shards you want. And finally, if you end up collecting all the shards, they become one singular growth modifier called the Star Orb, turning all of your individual modifiers into a single item with a plus 30% growth modifier across the board. It's still a fantastic item, but it's all packed into one instead of 12 individual modifiers of various quality. In my opinion, playing around with star shards strongly harkened me back to the good old simpler days of Fire Emblem of enjoying the random, mainly irrelevant units and making them into monsters. While it is still reliant on RNG, it strongly enhanced the sense of progression. Combined with the low stat caps of 20 in Fire Emblem 3, it all worked together to encourage me to keep using the units I wanted to use. Knowing that there is a tangible finish line of 20 across the board was encouraging. This encouragement and very visible reward for my decisions towards my units also translated into the game's map design. But hold on. Hold on a sec. Fire Emblem 5 does this to a very similar degree. In fact, a lot of the mechanics I enjoyed from FE3 are done in FE5 too. Mounting and dismounting, held growth modifiers, modern trading, and on top of all this, FE5 had its own slew of revolutionary mechanics like capture and rescue and that kind of thing. So, so what? Well, I'm getting to that. While I greatly enjoyed FE3's mechanics as outdated and outdone as they were, its gameplay, map design, unit placement, and pacing kept me coming back until I beat the game in three days. My enjoyment of the gameplay came from its refreshingly simple unit placement on top of these actually memorable chapters. Most chapters presented some kind of challenge, whether it was an anti-turtling incentive, introducing a new enemy type, or enemy reinforcements that spiced up the gameplay. Each chapter felt like a conscious effort to bring something new to the table without it being overly convoluted or complex. For me, this kept the gameplay interesting while not overly frustrating. FE3 is generally regarded as not a terribly difficult game, but not the easiest game to play either. I think it strikes a very solid balance between easy and hard. From personal experience, too easy of a map or a game and I'll go on autopilot and lose my desire to play too hard and it takes longer to complete a map, could take several sit downs which would disengage me personally, and if you're not in the right mindset, it could take you out of the game. I don't consider myself an expert Fire Emblem player, but I don't consider myself an entire scrub either. I found Thracia 776 to be very tough and at times extremely frustrating. I haven't played the harder difficulties of Shadow Dragon and I haven't played FE12, which I've noticed people say is the hardest game in the series. But on the other end, I beat Conquest Maddening Blind, I beat Thracia, Maddening Three Houses, Hector Hard Mode, so I would say I float in kind of the middle. The reason why I mentioned my skill here is if you feel like you're in the same camp as me as far as what difficulties you enjoy and what games you enjoy and that kind of thing, you might find that the admittedly simple looking gameplay and maps of FE3 can actually be quite fun and even relaxing, especially in contrast to Modern Fire Emblem, which have a lot of style to them and of course new mechanics well past what Fire Emblem 3 accomplished. But the proof is in the pudding. So let's actually talk about these maps. It felt like the maps were challenging and the objectives for the most part were intuitive. I don't mean objectives as in seizing or defeating a boss, I mean as in the map gimmicks were properly explained and implied. FE3 balanced its internal challenges with in-game hints that let the player have an idea of how to even plan. Combined with the sheer amount of uniqueness these challenges provided, I was always looking forward to the next map. Before I go into praise the game further, and because I know people would bring this up otherwise, no, the gameplay is not perfect. And the early game is probably the most arduous part of the gameplay experience. It's not the entire early game, but you do have to criticize the first three chapters. Chapter 1 is mostly harmless and teaches a new player to FE3 the mechanics pretty transparently. You'll figure out how most of FE3's mechanics work, particularly mounting and dismounting. There is a one tile wide mountain pass filled with mountain and hill terrain tiles. This tells us which unit types have good movement on the tiles and who doesn't. 
Marth can cross well, and Paladins can too, but Social Knights and Armor Knights and Archers struggle to move. While it is a nice in-game hint, I found the map itself to be too restrictive here. Like, yes, I get it, mountains are hard to move through, but do you really need to make me spend 5 turns trudging through enemies and mountain terrain just to get the boss to make me figure that out? Chapter 2 is really really fun, but has one critical flaw that can, that can potentially ruin the experience. Getting the Lady Blade in Chapter 2 requires you to use mounting and dismounting for Katria intelligently while also staying out of the range of the Wyvern Knights who have an oppressive 12 movement or else you risk having to chase down the thief whose AI is set to run away with it. The problem with the unit placement here is even if you account for the three hunters ready to attack Katria if she dismounts and kills the thief, it's that if all three hunters connect and we are working with a single RN around 70% chance to hit, Katria will die. This is really unfortunate because it makes the in-game challenge and reward for dismounting correctly too reliant on you having good RNG. The alternative route to acquire the Lady Sword is to kite Katria around the thief but then you run into another problem. She will probably get overwhelmed by wyvern lords or hunters depending on where the thief decides to run to. Honestly, the easier solution is to just keep restarting until one of the hunters misses. A really, really, really easy fix to make this chapter stand out and be one of the most memorable and good, well-designed chapters would be to just have one point less strength on one of the hunters or just give Keishira one more HP. The rest of the chapter plays out very, very fun. Chapter 3 is another instance of an otherwise fun chapter getting bogged down by one bizarre and quite frankly awful design choice. Marth is the only character that can visit villages, but he's not the only person that can recruit characters. If you want to recruit Mathis, you'll need to drag Marth completely around a mountain to recruit him, then get Julian to talk to him. Thankfully, Mathis is so god awful that he's literally a meme in the community, and again, the rest of the map is solid. The pack of wyverns on the mountain, which, while powerful, will only attack you if you visit the armory first, which is hinted by a villager to be kind of like the gangster armory at the start of the map. Once I got past mainly chapter 2 and 3, I found the game started to get really, really good. Chapter 4 was memorable because you get 4 new characters, Yubel, Yulia, Sirius, and Ogma, but the latter two need to defend the children from pirates. Yulia has a rescue staff which you could use to bring Marth over since staffs have infinite range. Chapter 5 tells you outright to mind your distance from George's sniper squad as you scale up and around the map. While that's happening, you can use your mounted units and strong infantry to destroy the ballisticians and work your way to the gate. Chapter 6 was especially memorable, throwing you Navarin Fina, your dancer. The gimmick here is that there are thieves with good loot beelining it to the top of the bridge, and you need to use Navar and Fina together to kill them before they escape. As that's happening, you need to deal with the reinforcements coming from Marth's side, and then a freaking fire dragon comes out. As this is all happening, you also need to be wary of Astrum's range, because they will only come after you if you get too close, which again is warned. Chapter 7 is a cool map aesthetically with a long bridge, but quickly turns into an escape map as Harden, who is impossible to defeat, pursues you starting on turn 6. Chapter 9 and 11 are admittedly pretty lame desert chapters, with Henri's Way being a giant pool of never-ending desert terrain, but at least you get introduced to flying dragons before what is my favorite chapter in the game, the Dragon Graveyard. A beautiful looking map with threatening barbarians and foot-locked dragons pursuing you from the south and flying dragons ready to come at you from the north. Like, damn, what a good map. You wanna know something cool too? In Chapter 17, the only way to recruit Samson and Sheena is if you don't kill any of her soldiers and only focus on the Arcanaeans. Remind you of anything? Yeah, that Path of Radiance chapter? Well, guess what? Kaga did it first. So you get the idea now. Nearly every single chapter provided a unique map gimmick which kept the gameplay fresh. Whether it was disencouraging you from turtling, demanding that you thoughtfully use mounting and dismounting, which included equipping cavalry and flyers with a mix of swords and lances if necessary, or providing you with in-game hints, there was always something to look forward to while providing you with cues on what to expect. What also enhanced the experience of expectation is that Book 2 is quite transparent with its reinforcements. You learn quick that this game mostly throws ambush spawns at you enemies spawning at the beginning of enemy phase. However, they for the most part do not bullshit you by appearing out of thin air. 
they like 99% of the time always are on top of fortresses, making you able to clog them up and predict where they're going to come from. And maybe it's just me, but they never even felt that powerful in comparison to the normally turn one fielded enemies. I can't believe I'm saying this, but FE3 did a fantastic job with their ambush spawns. Because the enemy placement was so simple to strategize around, I always felt encouraged to pursue each map at an upbeat pace. There wasn't really a reason to turtle in the first place. Which is very surprising to say for a game that is reliant on ambush spawns because generally the strategy behind that is to take your time and turtle because you're afraid to get jumped by random enemies that will kick your ass out of nowhere. That's not to say that this game was engaging 100% of the time. Marth being the only character able to visit villages was incredibly painful in some maps where the seas point and the village were extremely far apart. Again, Mathis is a meme because it's so shit. FE3 does suffer from pacing issues at times, simply because once you defeat a group of enemies, it can take a long time before you can engage on another group. Despite this complaint, the combat just feels so engaging. And when you combine the engaging level progression mechanics on your units with the fun map gimmicks and reasonable chapter goals and reinforcements, the end result is an incredibly enjoyable experience with tons of memorable moments. And you might think, yeah, all Fire Emblem games should do this, Ghast. Well, yeah, fucking course it should. That's what makes it a good ass Fire Emblem game. If you can overcome the old clunky first attempts at modern trading, dismounting, and its admittedly slower pace compared to genealogy in Thracia 776, I mean, let's be honest, you're going to fast forward anyway, I think you'll have a really enjoyable time playing the game. Despite its age, I personally find it to be an aesthetically gorgeous game with vibrant and colorful portraits and tile sets. Even its animations are crisp and fun to watch. Definitely better than the ugly claymation animations of freaking Shadow Dragon, I'll tell you that much. I don't think you'll tire visually from it at least, unlike its DS counterpart. Besides, my favorite character, Warren, needs more fans! Now you, now you listen to me, okay? My best boy, Warren, ranked like 556th at the first Fire Emblem Choose Your Legends popularity contest, okay? He is nearly dead last in voting and popularity, and that's a crying shame. So you know what I'm going to do? Once that CYL4 comes through, and we definitely know for sure that those, the big four is coming in, we're going to campaign. We're going to campaign for Warren, baby. Warren 2020, CYL. See you there. Deuces.